Good morning, everybody. Um, start of a new week, I guess. Um, we said this last time, a combinational circuit is a digital logic circuit for which the output is determined only by its inputs. If the inputs change, the output changes to reflect what that combinational circuit computes. Different combinational circuits compute different things. We saw an adder, we saw decoders, we saw multiplexers. Uh, I think we mentioned encoders, but didn't really look at one. Uh, the implication of that, and you've seen this slide before, the implication of that is that combinational circuits have no memory. Let's look at an example of what that means. You've seen the slide before, but I didn't show you an example. Here is a full adder. If the inputs are all off, both of the outputs are off. When an input comes on, the outputs change after a short delay. Um, in this animation, there's a half second delay between the time the inputs change and the time the outputs change um, in, a, in a real digital logic circuit, that delay would be in nanoseconds, right? But I made a half second delay so that you could see it. There is no memory at all in that circuit. If the inputs change, the output changes. If the inputs go away, in this particular circuit, the outputs go away very shortly after the inputs went away. So no memory at all. Um, does anybody have any questions about that one? No, you don't have to be able to draw a full adder for the exam. You might need to be able to recognize one where I have drawn it. Um, that I've, I have tried very hard in this course to distinguish between concepts which you need to know and details which you should look up when you need them. Okay, so a full adder has a provision for carry in as well as carry out. That's a concept. That's something you ought to know. How do you design a full adder? That's something you can look up if you ever need to know it again after this class is over. And if you have a question about what's a concept or a detail, please ask me. I want to show you the details because they'll help to enforce the concept, right? But do you memorize those details? No. So you should be able to recognize a full adder, describe what it is, or maybe define what a full adder does. Should you draw the circuit? Nah, that's something you can look up. Okay? So that's a combinational circuit. Outputs determined solely by the inputs and the nature of the circuit itself, of course. That was a giant pain in the posterior to do. It took me about half of yesterday. Okay, sequential circuit. So two different flavors of digital logic circuits, combinational and sequential. That's a concept. Sequential circuits have memory or as we might say, if we were trying to use big words, we could say sequential circuits maintain state. Another conceptual thing, something to know, sequential circuits maintain state because of feedback. The output of a circuit is fed back to one of the inputs. And I'll show you how that works in just a moment. Now we've done truth tables for our combinational circuits, including we did a truth table for addition. Um, truth tables aren't applicable to sequential circuits because remember, the output is fed back into the input. One of the outputs is connected to the input. Instead, we use something called a state table, and I'll show you a state table in just a moment as well. Okay, a reminder. You saw this slide when we first introduced the idea of digital logic gates. That's the NOR gate. It's the OR symbol with a negation bubble at the output. Um, it computes not A or B. And the output of NOR is one or true or on 
only when both the A and B inputs are zero or off or false. Okay, so the only way to get an output out of that NOR gate is to have both inputs be zero or off or false. Now, here is the simplest digital logic circuit that has memory. It's called an SR latch. That would be a good thing to remember. You can think of S and R as standing for set and reset. And I'll show you why they stand for set and reset in just a second. Uh, as you can see, the output of that upper NOR gate is one of the two inputs to the lower NOR gate. And the output of the lower NOR gate is one of the inputs to the upper one. So I have feedback from two outputs. And let's look at how the SR gate works um, in just a second. I got ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the S, I'm sorry, I said SR gate, it's an SR latch. It has two stable states, and the 25 cent word for that is that it is bistable. Um, either Q is on or not Q is on, but never both of them. So one or the other of Q or not Q. So let's look at the sequence. Um, when I have to wait and get caught up with this thing. When R comes on, not Q comes on, Q goes off. So reset turns Q off and not Q on. Reset does not have to stay on. It can go away and the state of the circuit is still stable. S or set turns Q on and turns not Q off. Then S can go away and the circuit remains stable. So look at that for a minute and be sure you follow what's going on. R turns Q off, S turns Q on. We're, we don't really need not Q and in a minute we're gonna get rid of it. So R reset turns Q off. S set turns Q on, and both R and S can then go away. And the circuit will remain stable until the other one of R or S comes on. So pressing or actuating the same input twice doesn't do anything? Actuating the same input twice doesn't do anything, correct. So if I do S and then do S again, no change in the output. Similarly, if I do R and then do R again. Is this the same kind of mechanism that some outputs have? Like electrical outputs? Um, There's like the test and reset buttons on it. Oh, okay. Test and reset buttons where test turns it off and, and reset turns it back on. Um, that, it's a very similar idea, yes. But there's, there's something else within those outlets, and it is either an arc fault or a ground fault detection circuit that could turn the outlet off if badness was about to happen. It, it's good to turn outlets off if badness is about to happen, especially if it's about to happen to me. Um, so let's look at that state table. The state table has S and R and Q on the left side, and then on the output side, we have this thing that we're going to call Q prime. That's the next state of Q. So we look at SR and the current state of Q, and the table tells us the next state of Q. Um, and we're interested in those things that are highlighted um, because they are the only ones where something happens. Um, to answer the question that I was asked a minute ago, if you look at the line just above the highlight, S is zero, R is one, but Q is already off. Q doesn't change, it stays off. So that question, if I give it the same input twice, does it change anything, is answered by the state table. Questions about that? The things that change stuff are highlighted. If R is a 1 and Q is a 1, 
next q, q prime becomes zero. R turns q off. If s is a one and r is a zero and q is a zero, q prime, the next q is one. Um, the state of s equals r equals one, both s and r one, the last two lines in the table, not allowed. What happens if, if we do that? The behavior of the circuit is undefined. It's going to depend a little bit on um, the, the, the way the circuit was constructed. Andrew Tannenbaum, in his computer architecture book, says the circuit is likely to oscillate. I think that that is flip-flop back and forth rapidly. I think he's wrong. And the reason I think he's wrong is that no two gates are exactly identical. If we do S equals R equals one, one of them's gonna win. It'll be the last one. But in any case, the, the SR latch is undefined for, those, for, those con for that one condition, which is two rows in the state table. Questions about that? I probably won't ask you to write a state table, but I might ask you to recognize one or maybe even to fill in a row or two of one where I've provided most of the rest of it. Okay, there are some problems with the SR latch, not the least of which is that there is a big black bar there in the middle of that slide that shouldn't be there. Um, it is the over bar for the stuff that I haven't shown you yet and I somehow let it show up. Um, the, the fundamental problem with the SR latch is I have to have set and reset. And I'd really like to just have a bit and be able to store it. I'd like to be able to store one bit. And then I could have 64 of those and store 64 bits, right? Um, S equals R equals one is not allowed, but there's nothing that prevents that. There's nothing in the, in the circuit that is the SR latch that keeps both S and R from being on at the same time. And as I said a minute ago, we don't really need not Q um, because it's always the opposite of Q, right? And we have a whole big box full of not gates. One of the things you might think of to, to prevent S equals R equals one is that two to one decoder that we looked at when we were looking at digital logic building blocks. Um, so if the D data input is a one, R would be a zero and S would be a one. The trouble with that, and it, that does fix S equals R equals one, that's now not possible, but now the output follows the input. We don't have any storage anymore. So that doesn't quite do it. It's kind of a good idea, but it doesn't work. So what does work? How are we doing? Okay, we're gonna finish early again. There are no questions. Everybody knows that you can also ask questions in D2L, right? And I do check it at least once a day, including on the weekends. I will not be checking it during the spring break week because I'll be in Athens at the Technology Students Association Conference. Um, but that's okay because you won't be doing any work on this course during spring break anyway, right? Okay. All right. So this thing, I now hit you in the face with all kinds of stuff all at once and nothing first. This thing is called a D-latch or a clocked d latch and we've added a second input we've still got the d input there and we've still got that two to one decoder um, if d is a zero or off or false that not gate produces a one or on or true if d is one or on or true the not gate produces a false but we get that true down to the s input of the sr latch the, the two gates on the right are just the same SR latch that we have looked at all along. The two AND gates 
are used to enable a signal to flow from the decoder to S or R. Um, and if you read the chapter, you saw a description of the AND gate as an enable signal. We didn't talk about it in class. See, reading the chapter is kind of important. Um, that was the chapter from, from um, Digital Logic Gates two class sessions ago. <clears throat> so what happens if enable is false, nothing can pass through either one of those AND gates because the AND gate needs both inputs to be one or true for its output to be true, right? Characteristic number 0001. So if enable is false, nothing happens with R or S. We just removed not Q, it's not necessary. And Q, if enable is false, Q cannot change because no signal can reach either R or S. If enable is true, and D is true or one, then S becomes true and Q gets turned on. If enable is true and D is false, that not gate turns R on and turns Q off. Exactly right. Enable is a signal that tells that D latch to store the contents of the D or data input. Uh, can I say that one more time? Maybe. Let me try it. Enable is a signal that, and let me say it this way, enables the SR latch part of that circuit to store the value that is input on D or data. D or data can be zero or one. It's only stored if enable is true. Now, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm a little old and deaf. I'm, I'm still having trouble trying to comprehend the SR latch. So okay. Um, yeah, let's back up to the one, um, let's back up one more. Okay, if R becomes one, and remember the only way, the only way to get an output from a NOR gate. Let's back up two more. Well, yeah. The only way to get an output from a NOR gate is for both inputs to be zero. Okay, this is, this is the, the key part to grabbing this idea. The only way to get an output from a NOR gate is for both inputs to be zero. Okay, if Q is turned on, is a one, the output to the lower NOR gate must be off because if one of the two inputs is a one. Okay. Um, if, it's, if it's the other way around, Q's off and not Q is on, um, then the output to the upper NOR gate must be off. Now let's look at it with the state that it's in right now. Q is on, not Q is off. So the one input, to the lower input to the top NOR gate is a zero because it's connected to not Q. Okay. Um, if R is also zero, Q stays on. If R is a one, Q necessarily turns off 
okay? Because now we have a zero and a one as inputs to that upper um, NOR gate. So if R turns on, Q turns off. But now I have an, a zero is the top input to the bottom NOR gate. If S is off, not Q will come on. Now, let us suppose that not Q is on, Q is off. We turn S on. That's going to turn not Q off. Okay? And now we have two zeros as inputs to the top NOR gate, and that's going to turn Q on. I'm not sure that helped. That was a understanding. It helped a little bit. Okay. Um, I suggest that you take this diagram, and I'll try to post the slides as soon as I get home. Um, it's easier for me to do that at home than it is to try to do it around here because I don't have an office. Um, I suggest that you take this diagram and that, well, there's the diagram and the state table, both on one slide. I suggest working through that state table, working through each row, because it'll tell you what is on S, R, and Q, and what happens to Q prime, which you might want to pronounce as next Q, the output. And I think if you, if you trudge through that, and trudging through it in detail will take five or six minutes. It's not something you can just glance at, but neither do you have to perseverate on it for an afternoon. So I think that, that applies to everybody who does not yet believe that the SR latch can store one bit of data. It would be to spend some time being sure that you understand this slide. Okay, let's move back forward to that D latch. Um, the right hand side of that is just an SR latch. The top left is a one to two decoder. Remember we had that NOT gate in two LEDs when we were looking at decoders last time? And the two AND gates only allow the signal from the decoder to pass through to the SR latch if the enable input is true or one or on. Questions about that one? There are three components to that thing. The SR latch is on the right. In the middle, and also the enable button, I have two AND gates that block any signals from getting through unless enable is true or one or on. And then at the top, top left, I have a D input to a, a one to two decoder. Um, if D is true or one, not D will be zero or false. If D is zero or false, not D will be one or true. So what's gonna happen is the input at the at the top of the upper AND gate and the input at the bottom of the lower AND gate will be opposite of each other. And only one or the other of them will get through because of the enable signal. Now we can store one bit of data. Questions? 
Okay, once again, this is something you should be able to recognize, not necessarily draw. If you need to draw one, you can look it up. Yes? So the D latch um, essentially fixes the problem that we have with the SNR, where it can't store that one bit of data? The D latch fixes two problems. It fixes the, the problem of not allowing S equals R equals 1, S and R both to be 1. And if we just did that with the decoder, um, we wouldn't have storage anymore. We have to prevent the signal from getting through until we are ready to sample it. And assuming we get, get to the end of what I've planned for today, um, we're going to see that that enable signal becomes a clock signal. And we're going to see... Um, this, this particular class is one in which a student had an aha experience. I love the aha experience. I'm further down in the slides and somebody said, I finally understand what the clock is for. So maybe somebody else will, in this class will have an aha experience. Maybe you'll understand what the clock is for. Okay, now I'm going to introduce a new kind of digital logic gate that we didn't discuss when we were talking about gates, and it's this thing called a tri-state buffer. Everything that we have seen so far produces either an on or an off, a logic one or logic zero at the output. Sometimes we want the output to be disconnected, neither one nor zero. Electrical engineers call that a high impedance state, and they abbreviate it high Z. Um, the tri-state buffer looks a little bit like a knot gate. The triangle symbol is the electrical engineering symbol for an amplifier. And then we put a negation bubble on that to make a knot gate, right? Well, there's no negation bubble here, but there is a third input called enable. And the way this works is that if, if enable is logic true, that is a one, um, the input and the output are connected to each other. If enable is a logic zero or false, the output is disconnected there is neither a zero nor a one there. It's like someone had cut the wire. And we're gonna see what that's good for in just a moment. All right, this thing is a one bit register. Um, the thing that is in in the rectangle there is a latch, similar to the D latch that we just looked at. Um, it's got an input, that would be the D input, and it's labeled D in. I've got both a write input and a clock input going into an AND gate, and that goes to enable. And we'll talk about that um, little triangle there at, in, at enable in just a minute. Then we've got an output, and the output is connected to two, um, let's see, I got ahead of myself. The input bus is connected to DN all the time, but data get, only gets sampled if both write and clock are logic one. Only if both write and clock are one will the output of that AND gate be a one, and that's connected to the enable input of the gate. Of the latch, sorry. And now separately, let's look at the outputs. Um, the output is active all the time. It could be zero or it could be one. That's the Q in that, uh, in that diagram of the D latch. And I have two tri-state buffers, enable A and enable B. And if enable A is true, that output is connected to something we're going to call an A bus. 
if enable B is true, the output is connected to something we're going to call a B bus. And they can both be enabled at the same time. There's no, nothing that prevents that from happening. Okay, that is a one bit register. It is almost never useful to store only one bit. Okay, so there should be forming in your minds right now. Oh man, I bought a uh, mystery novel featuring a Chinese character at the used bookstore many years ago. And in there was a slip from a fortune cookie that said, forget the doubts and fears that are creeping into your mind. Oops. All right. It's almost never useful to store one bit. Suppose we wanted to store two bits. Now I've got an input bus that is two bits wide. Both my A bus and my B bus are two bits wide. And I have two latches. What if I wanted to store three bits? Add another latch. What do I have to do with the buses? Add another line to each of all three buses. <clears throat> what if I wanted to store 64 bits? A whole lot of latches, and the buses are now 64 bits wide. Remember when I was telling you that there are relatively few building blocks, and then you just put them together like Legos? So once, once you have grabbed the idea of that D latch, it's pretty easy to get the idea of a 16 or 32 or 64 bit register. It's pretty easy to do, okay? And once we have grabbed the idea, we just draw a box and label it register. And we forget about all of those latches, okay? They're still there, um, but we don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, conceptually, this one is n one-bit registers, however many n might need to be, 8, 16, 32, 64. Um, n input bus lines, and the fat arrow tells us that there's more than one line on that bus. It doesn't tell us how many, but the fat arrow tells us there's more than one. And if we needed to know how many, we'd draw a diagonal through the fat arrow and put a number there. Like we would say slash 64, and then we would know that that's a 64-bit bus. The skinny arrows, right, enable A, and enable B, are only one signal. And we have abstracted away the clock. We know it has to be there, so now we don't have to worry about it anymore. You see why I was so emphatic about the idea of abstraction at the beginning of this course? We're going to abstract away a whole lot of the detail that we have gone through in the last several classes. So why did we go through it? Why did we, do, why did we go through all that pain? I just draw this and say that stores 64 bits, you're going to say, wow, magic. But today, if I draw that and say it stores 64 bits, you say, uh-huh, yeah, stores 64 bits. I'm not sure I remember all the details about how it does that, but yes, I, I know we can build that and make it store 64 bits. You will like the last slide today, assuming we get to the last slide. All right. Now let's think about computation. Uh, I want to compute A plus B and store it back in variable, num variable A. This is something that you might write in Java or Python or JavaScript or about any language, right? 
Okay, if A and B are in registers, that computation works this way. We enable A onto the A bus, we enable B onto the B bus, we feed them both into an adder. The output of the adder goes to this thing that's labeled a C bus, the C bus is new, and back into A. So when you write, A is assigned A plus B in Python, this is what happens inside the computer. Is there a problem? We've changed the value of A, but we're still adding A on the A bus. And we might, we might completely stomp all over the previous value of A and confuse things horribly. We don't, and I'm gonna show you why not, okay? And here is where we talk about the clock. Um, in one clock cycle, and it is from the rising edge on the left to the next rising edge over there on the right, we're going to send data to the compute element. In this case, it's an adder. Later, it's gonna be an arithmetic logic unit. Combinational logic will do the computation, and then, on the rising edge of the clock, we're going to send an enable signal to that A register and tell it grab the contents of the input, which is now called a C bus, and store it, okay? Um, registers are enabled onto, into the adder on the falling edge, and the result is stored on the rising edge. And the, um, the first line on there, says the clock is asymmetric. All that means is that the period of low signal is different from the period of high signal. And in the diagram up there, the, the high period is very short and the low period is very long. How long? Long enough for the computation to take place. Remember at the beginning of class, we saw the gate delay through that adder. The gate delay is non-zero. And so we have to wait. And it's the clock that doesn't tell us how fast to go. It tells how slowly to go until the computation is complete. We'll talk about overclocking in a moment. But let's go back, and I told you I would uh, talk about that triangle. The triangle at the input says that this is edge triggered. That means the latch is going to grab the contents of the input bus, not while right and clock are high, but only during that transition from low to high. All right, so how do you make an edge triggered latch? You go look in a digital logic book. All right, that's for the guys over in the electrical engineering building, okay? Um, we are going to believe edge-triggered latch, all right? And there's, there's very little that I wanna, wanna ask you just to believe. Um, I showed you the carry anticipation adder and it made your brains slam shut. I, I, I could show you a diagram of an edge triggered latch and it would make your brain slam shut. Um, the essential idea is there is a very short gate delay through a not gate and I can watch for the change in that signal and through that short delay pass data from one latch to the second only at the instant that the clock signal changes. All right, that's the theory. The practice is over across the way in the electrical engineering building, all right? I can have both rising edge, and those are called positive edge triggered, and falling edge, those are called negative edge triggered devices. And so I need um, negative edge triggered devices at the beginning of that clock cycle when the clock is falling, and positive edge triggered devices at the end of the clock cycle. 
do not worry about this. Um, for the purposes of this course, you're going to remember that edge triggered devices exist and work like I just told you. Does anyone have a burning desire to explore the edge triggered latch? No takers. Okay. Um, I do have a diagram of one in one of my computer architecture books, but you don't need it. Okay. The clock is what keeps the fact that the output of the adder is input to A and the output of A is input to the adder. There's a kind of circle there. And that circle would be bad news if we didn't have a clock. On the falling edge of the clock, both A and B get enabled onto the A and B buses. The adder is combinational logic, so it's computing all the time. But it doesn't have a good answer until it has good A and B inputs. So the adder goes grind crunch whir and computes a sum and after the gate delay through the adder, the sum is stable on the C bus. And then on the rising edge of the clock, the result from the C bus gets stored in A. Now that still doesn't tell us, that still doesn't completely convince us that there's not a problem there. Um, a nanosecond is about this long. I think she has her hands a little bit too far apart. Um, but signals travel in computer systems at about 75, 70 percent of the speed of light. So a nanosecond is a little less than 12 inches. Okay. Um, a non-zero time for a signal to travel between two points. If gates are involved, we have the gate delay as well. So there's propagation delay, 70% of the speed of light through the circuits, and gate delay through whatever gates might be in the way. She made a very good grade in this class by studying. Okay, so A and B are still enabled to the A and B buses when the value on the C bus changes. But the clock has not yet told A to the A register to sample the bus. Um, that happens at the rising edge of the clock at the end of the clock cycle. And that happens long before the change can propagate all the way through. We, we grab it in an instant with that edge triggered latch. All right, so ha let's have another look at the clock. Um, and I've copied the diagram of, of our A and B latches and the adder down at the bottom. The clock cycle is low for a long time, but a bunch of stuff happens while the clock cycle is low. First of all, the control signals, the enable signals to the A and B registers have to be set up. And that takes a non-zero period of time. Um, when we talk about the von Neumann architecture on Thursday, we'll talk about decoding instructions and setting up those control signals. But it takes a non-zero period of time, but fairly short. Then, after the control signal is set up, A is now sending its value, whatever's in A, to the A bus, and so is B sending it to the B bus. But a nanosecond is this long. It takes a non-zero time for the contents of the A and B registers to reach the adder. It can happen very fast, but um, a non-zero time. All right, now we have computation through the adder, and a little bit later we're going to change that adder into an arithmetic logic unit. That is the largest chunk of the time necessary to perform this addition because we got gate delays through that adder, right? Then the signal has to travel from the output of the adder up to 
the two, reg well, actually it's only connected to the A register. Signal has to travel from the output of the adder up to the A register. And a nanosecond being this long, that is also a non-zero time. Finally, there's this thing labeled tolerance. Electrical engineers, the d people who design computer chips, can compute how long each of those steps will take using the components that they are using, whichever ones they've selected, and the layout and the lengths of the buses and all of that rest of that stuff, they can compute how long that will take. Guess what? No two electrical components are exactly alike. So the engineers build in a little bit of extra time called tolerance. And now I told you we would talk about overclocking. When you overclock your CPU, you are reducing the amount of time in the tolerance zone. All the rest of that stuff still has to happen. <clears throat> if you overclock it too much, one of two things will happen. Well, you get, uh, worse than that, you might get blue smoke. Um, the other thing that the engineers have calculated is heat dissipation from that processor. The faster the processor runs, the faster do the transistors change states, and every time a transistor changes state, some heat is generated. And so if you overclock it too much, one of two things, you'll get wrong answers because the computation in the middle might not have finished, or the computation is finished, but it never made it back to the registers. What is much more likely is that you will let all of the magic blue smoke out of your processor. Um, this, is, this is called melting the processor. And I used to, in this class, ask anybody if they've overclocked their processors. And um, eventually somebody would have to admit that he had smoked a $300 CPU chip. So I don't ask that question anymore. It's not nice to embarrass people that way. Um, so I, I said this once already today, the purpose of the, of the clock is to make sure that things happen slowly enough for all of those steps to finish. And you can't just arbitrarily increase the speed of the clock beyond that area labeled tolerance. Do not let all the smoke out of a $300 CPU chip. Um, it is impossible to replace the smoke. And I guess I better quit saying that because eventually someone will leave this class believing that CPU chips run on smoke. And when you let all the smoke out, they don't work anymore. Um, <laughs> that is not true, okay? All right. Um, we have been down in the weeds of how computers work from um, Boolean algebra, digital logic, combinational circuits, and now sequential circuits. We still have a little bit of work to do with digital logic and gates, but we are about to move from individual gates to functionality. We're going to design next Tuesday a simple arithmetic logic unit and then assemble it into a simple computer up on the screen, right? We're, we're not really... Um, I'm very sad that our accrediting agency says we have to do the same thing with our distance classes as we do in class. Because I used to, we'd go down to the, to the lab up on the second floor there and take apart old computers that had been retired from use in the lab. And I found students who had never opened up a computer before can't do that because we uh, can't provide that opportunity to the distance students. Oh well. But if you've never opened up a computer, talk to me. 
Maybe we, maybe we can work something out. Distance students, if you've never opened up a computer, talk to me. You'll have to come to campus. All right, that, um, all right, so we did it. We got about um, 18 or so minutes left. That's not as bad as I had feared. Who has questions about any of this stuff? All right, if the SR latch is still bugging you, um, go to the slide that has the state table on it and work your way through the state table, maybe printing that slide and drawing some zeros and ones actually on the piece of paper um, and looking at what the outputs have to be. Remembering the truth table for the NOR gate, the NOR gate produces a one only when both inputs are zero. So it has a characteristic number of one zero zero zero. If the D-latch is bothering you, um, once again, you can go work through the D-latch. It, it is very logical. It's just that there's a bunch of it. There's, there is one, two, three pieces there that all work together. And so you might have to, to trudge your way through that. If you have questions, put them in D2L before Thursday. That way I can answer them before Thursday. If you have questions about how that AND gate can do an enable function, it's in chapter two of the book, which is free and in D2L. You don't even have to go to the bookstore. Anything else? Dead silence. Nobody. Okay. Have a good afternoon, a nice rest of the week, and I'll see you on Thursday.